assessment of what you think is happening um, or you know is happening, right, on the EVM side of things, and, and we'll kind of take it from there. <laughs> Okie doke. Um, let's see. So uh, I've mostly been uh, trying to keep up with several refactorings that were happening. Um, we we refactored the agent ID to include uh, Ethereum addresses, and uh, to do that, we refactored it into an interface where it was uh, a structure before, and now every type of agent ID has its own structure uh, that that uh, follows the same interface. And those changes uh, meant that I had to uh, change some stuff because the byte serialization uh, changed. We also, uh, or at least I, encountered so many we weird ways of printing uh, agent IDs and addresses and such. There was no consistency there. We had uh, hexadecimal dumps, either with or without a 0x prefix. We had uh, back to 32 encoding, which uh, has uh, a network prefix, which which caused all kinds of havoc. And so I uh, started rattling the cage about that. And uh, the result was that we did some refactoring on that to create consistency uh, now we uh, we always use back 32 encoding and mm -hmm. to be sure that that works better we uh, had to refactor the configuration because the back 32 encoding includes the network id and the network id is not something you want to pass around to just about every function because that's uh, that's stupid you only load it once in the configuration, and then you get it from a static, static single variable, right? But it was being passed around uh, in set to several functions, and so yeah, it it, it was quite a, a messy bit uh, that had grown over time. Uh, some parts were old stuff, some parts were new stuff, some parts were new users doing it their way, or new uh, developers doing it their way. So. <clears throat> Uh, me and George uh, uh, straightened all that out. Uh, we discussed how how to get consistency. So all addresses are now always uh, back thirty two encoded. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, uh, the the network ID is in there. So for example, the test net will have uh, I two A as a prefix, whereas the main net will have IOTA. So I2A is IOTA in reverse, right? Mm -hmm. And we can have different prefixes for simmer and for assembly and whatnot, and thereby <coughs> that's a, a feature. Um, the transactions are going to contain this network ID as well, and that is to combat replaying uh, on different networks. So since your transactions are signed with the network ID inside, uh, you cannot simply replay a transaction for the same address or for the same whatever <coughs> on a different network because the signature won't match because it's a different network ID and the messages with the wrong network ID will be rejected. <coughs> so that's... Uh, Sorry, I have a foggy mic. No worries. <coughs> so, that should be better. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole dying thing is a slow process. <laughs> <coughs> uh... Anyway, uh, yeah, so all that refactoring uh, meant uh, quite a bit of work because, of course, I had to... Uh, do my equivalent types in the WASM library and had to do that in three languages. So uh, that was uh, 
a bunch of testing that we would need as well. So I also set uh, Yang how to work to create all the tests that we needed. <coughs> and uh, yeah, the end result is that we now are in sync again with uh, with everything in uh, in Wasp. And that uh, everything is cleaned up and that now our debug log uh, doesn't mix uh, weird concepts. <coughs> mm -hmm. Because it, it it had some other consequences as well, right? If you were looking for an address in, uh, in the log, you never knew whether you would have to look for the hexadecimal or for the back-end coded version, for example. So it makes our own life a lot easier as well. That's good. <coughs> So that has been mostly uh, my weeks. Uh, that, that was an unexpected uh, lot of extra work. So uh, once again, I didn't get to uh, the TypeScript client library that I wanted to work on, which has now been moved to the next uh, week. <laughs> right, right. <clears throat> but it, it seems like that, that was rather important. So. Now, now you have both sides of the house talking the same thing. So that's yeah, pretty, yeah. There's a consistency across the yeah, board. Yeah, and, and yeah. this had to be done in tandem because otherwise a yes. bunch of tests were failing, and uh, and and all of a sudden uh, was uh, couldn't could no long or wasn't could no longer properly talk to the was sandbox. <clears throat> so now that is all straightened out. Plus we have. Uh, we have a bunch of tests now, thanks to Yang Hao, uh, that, uh, that cover pretty much uh, all types. And that means that if they decide to change yet again something, uh, we, we immediately get notified because those tests will start failing. Yeah, that's really good. Even if the systems aren't in place to notify you now, that's your, that's your early warning system. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I I like uh, paranoid programming. Every every time <laughs> I need to talk to some other system, I uh, set up a wall of tests in between to make sure that it's working the way I expect it to work. And then any change that happens on the other side is immediately triggering failing tests, and thereby uh, I will not be running with any uh, stupid bugs or anything. <clears throat> right. Um, so that's pretty much it on my and uh, Yang House end with the the Wasm stuff. Um, the all the tests that what Yang Hao created for uh, the generated interface to the core contracts. Uh, that task has also been completed. So we have a, a comprehensive set of tests now that test the interface, not not necessarily the content. We don't really care much about that but this these tests will detect any changes in the core contracts interface and then we can change our uh, yaml files that describe the the core contracts accordingly <coughs> so that we we don't uh, uh, get way behind any core contract changes like we did in the past when uh, when the whole starters thing started uh, yeah, those tasks are done. That's great. Um, then what? What are other people doing? Um, I believe uh, Diego is working hard on on some EVM related stuff, getting several parts of the sandbox to work. Um, um, We've had uh, several discussions uh, with respect to the future, um, uh, the whole assembly uh, concept <coughs> to see what is possible and what is needed and whether we're going to focus on parts of assembly already or not. And um, that is going to be, uh, well, that's going to be fun, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
mostly this was triggered because of uh, the the several rug pulls that were uh, happening in the last few weeks in the crypto uh, community. Yeah. Um, and of course, Eval does have his own personal view, which I very much agree with uh, on what is going on, and that is that most uh, things like uh, well, the roll-up systems in uh, that that they're creating, etc., mm -hmm. to 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 verify that everything is uh, correct. Yes, with uh, with, with all the guardians, transactions, guardians yeah, right. or nodes or fishermen or policemen or whatever they call them <clears throat> to <laughs> double-check results and uh, find proof of uh, malicious intent. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, we just saw how well that works. Um, it's fun because they could prove malicious intent after the fact. Yeah, that's exactly that. That's the whole thing with I've always thought about this is just that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, you have this... seven days to be able. If if you're a malevolent act, a malevolent actor, you just say, "I got seven days to be able to like, you know." Take take whatever I can get and just disappear, right? And then it's like yeah. oh, they go, hey. Then you come back with seven days later and say, oh, hey, we found out that there was an issue here. And they it's like it's like, well, that guy's like, that guy got yeah, on the, it, the it, bank, got on the freeway, and has been driving for five five days. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's it's it, it's it's like uh, the the ATM at the bank uh, doesn't need need your pass right now and starts dispensing money like crazy and does that for, until the entire ATM is empty. And then the bank says, oh, look, we have proof that this ATM is failing, but the money is gone and unretrievable. So what's the use of uh, those kind of proofs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially given the fact that uh, if you start looking at zero knowledge proofs, that uh, they require a ridiculous amount of resources to construct, which means that you will be happy to have one transaction per second in your network, mm -hmm. <coughs> which is, well, completely bonkers, and, and, and it's, it doesn't scale. So the technology with respect to zero-knowledge proofs is, uh, is in its infancy, and uh, even though we looked into it, we're not going to be uh, doing anything with it for now, uh, especially because the way we set up the ISC, it wasn't designed with zero knowledge proof in mind, right? With zero knowledge proof, you you need you need uh, your engine needs to be zero knowledge proof compliant, kind of. <clears throat> which we're currently not, and we're also not about to start yet another refactoring to make it that, because yeah. we want to finally deliver something. Sure. <clears throat> and um, all the research and such is still years out. Um, let let other people uh, break their neck on that for now, and uh, we're just going to continue on the path we're continuing. Um, the whole proof situation is kind of, well, I feel it as a, a, a completely nonsensical thing. It's, it's, it's nice to be able to detect that it's happened so, it, so you can plug the hole and it doesn't happen again. But in that regard, it's more like a unit test yeah. than that it protects you, right? And you want you want to prevent malicious stuff yeah so we've we've been talking about ideas and there are one or two ideas floating around that might be able to uh, help so a research department is looking at that mm -hmm. um so another way to tackle the problem Totally yeah, yeah a way a way to more like uh, mitigate the problem right um, an example that uh, Ivaldas came with is um, 
not being able to take out everything all at once, but having to go to a number of steps if you want to uh, want to press the collect button, mm -hmm. and then uh, match that up with the stake that is there, so that you can never withdraw more value than your stake or something like that. Kind of a multi-factor uh, verification. Yeah, but it, it still has, has, has a lot of problems as well, right? Because, um, I mean, if I withdraw an NFT that's worth uh, 10 million and the stake was only $10,000, well, I cannot split it up in multiple. So the, the real world value could be hugely different from the stake. So there, there's a lot of problems with uh, with with that kind of thing. Uh, staking is is in my opinion uh, a nonsensical thing, and given the fact that uh, Ethereum has been building the staking for what is it five six years now, <laughs> uh, without anything to show for, shows that it's uh, that it is more a nice sounding thing but uh, once you dive into practicalities of it you bump into all kinds of problems with it so yeah we're going to have to uh come up with something at, eventually that's for sure but uh, right now uh, our conclusion was that we're going to keep focused on delivering the first version of isc and once we get to that point uh, that we uh, get in calmer waters, that's when we're going to revisit the question. So that was that discussion. Yeah, that's a big discussion. So that's interesting to hear. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. It was fun because, uh, of course, they planned it yesterday at uh, six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so that was my. Uh, day off. <laughs> it was a whole oh. day work. So I got up at uh, at an ungodly hour to be part of that discussion because I found it an interesting discussion and I was happy that I didn't have to talk much because Ivaldas did most of the talking and we we have lots of agreement in our vision in that respect. So that how did the, how, just out of curiosity, how did the other people uh, respond? Um, most most uh, see the points that Ivalos mm -hmm. is making. Um, yeah. uh, Dom was also in, in that conversation yesterday. And of course, uh, yeah, he, he looks at it from a slightly different viewpoint because, uh, because of the things we put out there for uh, assembly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's going to be something that is necessary for assembly. Uh, but how exactly? Right. My my personal opinion: assembly is an ill-defined mess. I I yeah. don't like assembly at all. It's 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 an ill ill thought out concept and 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 it, it needs lots of filling in of blanks before it becomes something solid okay let's keep it at that yeah i sense that uh so i my my my, my feeling is that that we should just my my feeling here is is that shimmer seems to be just let's concentrate on that and get that right exactly exactly yeah. so uh as far as that is concerned, the uh, the Hornet network uh, is uh, is moving forward nicely, and we're we're quite confident that the initial test network, or potentially without ISC uh, already running on it, is the I don't know, but six to eight weeks out, which matches up with everything i've been saying uh, yeah it sure does for months now for if not longer last year even <laughs> that we we wouldn't have to worry about uh, having anything running before the summer uh and 
yeah, we're we're getting there too. So it's going to be interesting to see if we can match uh, that time frame or if you guys show up almost longer. at the same time, huh? Then it, yeah, there won't yeah. won't be a big lag, I think. That's great. Yeah, so that's that's good. Um, so uh, with that yeah. zero, so just out of curiosity, with, with the revelation about. You know, the ZK stuff kind of being uh, not something that's like uh, maybe in the future, if anything. Um, does that affect anything to do uh, with uh, proof of inclusion or is that totally separate? No, proof of inclusion is uh, is already there. It's, yeah, it, that's what it, I thought, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if all this took some proof of inclusion work and it Proved on it and uh, put that uh, in in a repository, and we're using that uh, this cool. in the ISC that's already. What I, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's good, <clears throat> but proof of inclusion doesn't is it necessary to prove malicious intent uh, of a? No, uh, no, I understand that. It's just of, telling of you, hey, player, it, right? it, yeah, yeah, all it, it is is telling you is it, it was there at some point, right, or it's yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Right? yeah. 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 Can tell you that it's there without having to uh, right. maintain all that data. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that's the that's the other other thing, right? I was I was just discussing that in uh, in in the in one of the smart contract channels on Discord. Um, someone was asking about uh, uh, whether a policeman could revert a transaction if he found any malicious intent. But um, like I said, uh, you you would have to have some kind of policeman role, and that means that you would have to move the trust to the policeman. Yeah, doesn't because work. that because you trust that policeman to roll back transactions. Yeah, it's right? the whole <laughs> who watches the watchers issue, right? Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. and then you 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 get like uh, in incentive. For the policeman to do malicious yeah, things. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. D difficult thing. Uh, maybe when I uh, when I get my hands free, I will throw some of my mental resources. But that's see what I. Uh oh, oh watch out, world. <laughs> okay. But uh, <laughs> for now, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to finally get uh, the client code uh, for TypeScript working because. That's an important component to have, right? Oh yeah. Every, every uh, smart contract needs an interface, and if if the interface uh, code is going to be have to ha going to have to be built by everyone, that's that's completely bonkers in my opinion. So uh, a solid interface. Is yeah, yeah, you, you, you know better. Yeah, you know, that's the way to go for sure. Yeah. So we've got. Uh... We're basically now looking at uh, a, f a f well, like six to eight weeks. Things seem like they're going into plan. Um, at least, just concentrating on on Shimmer. Uh, any any gotchas or any things that you guys uncovered that says, "Well, this is going to need a little bit more work," or we haven't thought about that yet. Um, are you hitting anything new uh, that that's a blocker? No, not really blockers. I do know uh, chasing one bug um, that shows up when we run uh, huge concurrency tests. So one of those mo really difficult ones to figure out. Yeah. <clears throat> but you, I mean, you've identified it, and now you just you're hunting it down, and you're trying to re duplicate it, right? And that's the hard thing, right? So. Yeah, yeah, and and I think we have an, an issue with. Uh, with the nonce value for uh, off ledger contracts, of off ledger requests. So mm. those those are being chased. Um, for the rest, uh, everybody's uh, just chugging along and uh, producing essentially. <laughs> okay. So yeah, uh, that's uh, that's about what I've seen and heard. 
Okay, from there. Um, well, let's, uh, you guys, you know, Eric is here to like answer any questions, um, but this is also for the rest of the community. So uh, we have some devs out there. Do you have, guys have any questions? You want to delve in and ask Eric some stuff? Well, okay, well, we might be, uh, we might be getting close to giving, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Yeah, no, I just had a, a quick comment. Uh, Eric, I'm still here waiting and willing to help with the Rust client code. Uh, I know that's been kind of punted. I kind of threw my hand in the hat, I don't know, weeks or even months ago at this point. I'm happy to do that. I know, it, as you rightly said, TypeScript is more important to get done. I'm anxiously and eagerly awaiting to be able to run anything on Shimmer. Yeah. Or otherwise. So, yeah. I, uh, I know um, the thing is... Um, I have the initial interface in Go working, and I'd like to get the TypeScript version uh, with the same kind of interface working as well before uh, solidifying the interface. And then I can pass you the, the interface specification. Uh, this is uh, what it needs to do. And uh, then I, I can just... Uh, if you do your thing, but to do that, I first need the specification to be solidified. So, yeah, sure. I'm the recognizing egg, yeah. more and more of the necessity um, and broader applicability of uh, just a TypeScript and a web-based solution. Yeah, or maybe what I could do, because there there are certain functionalities that will be necessary. Maybe I can. Uh, chop those up already so so you can have those kind of as, as components that can be used that might be an idea that way we we work more in parallel yeah i have you know uh, not to pressure you in any way but i have other things as well and i need to kind of allocate yeah more time and prioritize to know when like, of when course hop on those <clears throat> Of course, I don't think take that thing for granted. But uh, yeah, like I said, I've I've been I've been distracted so much in the last few months that uh, every time I pick it up, I have to almost start from scratch in my head because it, I, it's been uh, been weeks since I looked at it. Sure, yeah, context switching has an enormous cost. I realize that as well. Being yeah, different projects at the same time. Yeah. But yeah, just getting getting Shimmer over the line is more important than you know one more client language of choice. I can I can use TypeScript as a kid in the community more than Rust. So that's it. Yeah, for sure. Um, if anybody here um knows of a Solidity developer, um, let me know. Um, I have several requests from people in the community, so a DM, DM me or whatever. GMAN214, I'm trying to help uh, community members uh, allocate resources out there. So, um, you know, I, I I think this is probably, you know, a Hail Mary, but I just got another request from somebody, so I thought I'd just ask. So if you know anybody, send them my way. Yeah. I, as well, I don't want to hijack that. I, but I, what I do want to comment on to that is, um, Eric, if you can speak more to the progress and the emphasis for EVM versus the WASM based contract, um, which one will, in your view, get more love long term equal? Or is it 95.5? <laughs> By two. I want to ask the same. <laughs> I have no you're asking, you're asking the guy clue. who's making you're asking the guy who <laughs> writes WASM if, if he thinks EVM is going to beat it. Yeah, I, I know. But, you know, I, I know. I'm going to be. Let's yeah, see. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I have no freaking clue actually. Okay. Um, it's uh, the whole DeFi environment um, as as it's built uh, on on the Ethereum uh, side. That is actually the the carrot that caused the EVM to be pushed forward. Right, we, we yeah. want to be able to quickly leverage that. Ecosystem, uh, however mismatched it may be. So, 
yeah, um, I I don't have the overview of that. Um, I'm just building a, a generic um, engine uh, that provides everything that the Wasp sandbox provides. <coughs> uh, so we can do everything. Um, the way Diego set up the the EVM with a special uh, built-in contract that can be called, which is essentially the sandbox interface, makes it so you can have uh, Solidity code and such calling EVM or calling ISC uh, functionality, sandbox functionality. Uh, but it's different than just um, just deploying existing DeFi code on the IOTA chain. Right? If 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 you're deploying existing code that will have absolutely no idea about the the ISC sandbox, it will simply run in the EVM sandbox with 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 all the functionality that it already had when it was running on another EVM chain. Right. Right. So if you want to add to that specific things that IOTA provides you will have to write code that actually uh, talks to the sandbox in solidity in this in this uh, instance and that means that uh, yeah you're going to somehow have to integrate that with your the rest of your defi so what makes sense in that regard right um you can you can use the foundries for example I, i'm i'm sure that that functionality will be there and create tokens and whatnot but you would somehow have to wrap that in an erc interface so that the other DeFi components can use it and then the question becomes is it is it possible to wrap it in an erc interface because, as I've indicated uh, a few times in the past, once you start looking at ERC, you see that the ERC contract has to keep track of every token to keep the administration straight. But if you have tokens that are running on the IOTA chain as native tokens, they can be passed around from address to address, and there's no way for the smart contract to keep track of where they are. Right. Yeah. That's, the, that's the function of the level one tangle to keep track of that. Right? So you, only when you start using them as, as wrapped tokens that's that's maybe when you can do stuff <clears throat> but you have to literally uh wrap the tokens inside your contract <clears throat> so that they can be used by the contract and by erc contracts by erc aware contracts let's, let's say that that but because erc uh 721 or erc20 yeah. or whatever right. you have, it's an interface right mm -hmm. <clears throat> it provides you with a way to uh, access an accounting system, essentially. Right? It, it allows you to deposit, to withdraw, to, to send tokens from A to B, uh, all those kinds of things. And uh, in addition, there's some functionality to create tokens and to destroy tokens and whatnot. Well, that's, that's all nice. <coughs> So essentially what you would get is that if you have tokens that are have been created by an IOTA foundry, they run wild on the IOTA chain, on the IOTA tangle. So 
what you would get is that at some point somebody would send tokens to a smart contract. That moment the smart contract becomes the owner, inflates its supply of that token as a wrapped token. So it keeps track of all the tokens it knows about because it holds them. It's much like an, uh, like an exchange keeps accounting. Right? You send tokens to the exchange, and the exchange keeps track of who owns what. Well, that is what the smart contract accounting system does at level two. If you send tokens, the accounting system keeps track of who owns what. Well, if your token is governed by a smart contract, then you get actually yet another level where that smart contract becomes the one that has to keep track of who owns what within the smart contract because the accounting system of the chain handles the accounting for multiple smart contracts that run on that chain, right? So you get a level three accounting uh, within your smart contract somehow where the tokens are wrapped and then that can, that could interface uh, or function as an, as an ERC interface. But you have to write the whole code that wraps everything and handles everything correctly and uh, controls the foundry, for example, uh, you will have to write that code specifically to be able to connect to anything that uh, that has an uh, ERC721 or ERC20 awareness. So it, it's, it's not that straightforward a process as it, it seems. It's, it sounds so so nice, right? Oh, we can run EVM on, uh, on on IOTA. Yeah, we can. But that's uh, like saying uh, we 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 can we can have uh, somebody who just got uh, got a driver's license, drive a Porsche or a Ferrari. Um. I wouldn't want to be near that person when he drives those things because those things are lethal weapons for somebody who doesn't know what he's doing and doesn't have the experience yet of, of what those machines are doing. Uh, you can say, yeah, he can drive them. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you have to drive it responsibly, correctly. You, all the extra things it can do Compared to a normal car, you want to add if there's, uh, uh, you, you remember those those uh, Fast and Furious cars? They always have uh, <laughs> have an NOX button somewhere, right? Where they push the button and then all of a sudden the car goes like uh, twice the speed of light or something like that. Well, you need to know how to use that and you need to be able to control your car when it speeds like that. Well, that's what you need to do when you connect it to ISC, right? You need to know what you're doing and you need to have an intimate knowledge of how the tokenization framework on ISC is working to be able to wrap it in an, in an Ethereum style contract so that it can talk to other Ethereum style contracts that were already existing and are part of an an existing large uh, DeFi uh, uh, setting system. So that's that's EVM. Uh, on the other side, with the Wasm side, we don't have an existing DeFi. We can build it all, but we're going to have to build it all essentially. Right, uh, that that's one of the reasons that I created the schema tool is to take the 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 drudge work out of the equation because otherwise they would have to write all the interfacing code etc themselves. Now they can can concentrate on on building smart contracts with a given functionality. Uh, that that makes things easier, but which ones of those will win? I have no idea. And, and again, also with the WASM uh, version, you will need an intimate knowledge of how the tokenization framework on the Tangle works. 
because you're still going to have to wrap all kinds of stuff in smart contracts. So for example, if I create a, a token governed by a smart contract, well, the smart contract gets the foundry and controls the foundry. And in a similar way as I described for the, for the EVM, for the ERC contracts, uh, those tokens are going to be wrapped in the smart contract for the contract to be keeping track of the the amount of tokens there are in in going around, for example, right? Um, it's there's a lot of knowledge involved. So I I uh, I can re really recommend uh, digging into the the, the tokenization framework uh, stuff that we have, uh, limited as it is, to get an idea of what it is you can do, because the, the amount of things you will be able to do is staggering. There's, there's all kinds of very interesting stuff that you can do that, that are begging for all kinds of applications, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the fact that you can uh well time time lock functionality with an iota twist let's say yep. uh is is very powerful you can do all kinds of things with that all right so i i i bet i'm betting that the, the first few applications that show up are swapping uh, applications Swap token A for token B because it's so simple and you don't need anybody that, that, that doesn't need to be a trusted party involved other than the smart contract uh, um, nodes, the, the, the group of nodes that runs the smart contract. Is the, the, that's the only, only trust factor that you still have, but for the rest, all the swapping between different tokens that are being run by different groups of nodes, uh, that happens on the tangle in a trustless fashion. That that's that that's that alone is a is a is a paradigm breaker in in crypto, right? Because normally what you have is that you have to put the collateral or the, or the, the tokens you give them to a trusted party. Uh, and then you get back tokens, uh, the tokens that you wanted. But the trusted party is the one that holds the tokens all the time in the meantime. Well, you can write a, a, a swapping application on IOTA where your tokens never leave the, your wallet unless you want to trade them. So you don't have to hold them on an exchange like we do now, with the risk that the exchange does a rug pull. Right? We've seen we've seen that in the past with uh, what was the name of that, that huge Bitcoin exchange that all the way in the beginning, 2017 or so. Yeah. The Japanese one. That was fun. Yeah. Right? So so of course uh if I I had an exchange, I would never do a rug pull because if I kill the golden goose, it's like the bank always wins, right? <laughs> yeah, that's but so true. We can build a swapping mechanism in IOTA with hardly any fees, where you can swap X for Y, just by indicating that you want to swap those. You send the tokens you want to swap to the smart contract, and those are the only tokens that are temporarily out of your control, and not even that that much, because uh, there are several several ways of doing this. Uh, on level one, it can even be done, I think, but on level two, which is my, uh, my forte, of course, I would send them to a contract. The contract holds them, but they ho it holds them for you so you can always pull them back if you decide otherwise if it takes too long for example for a matching bid to show up 
and and the the smart contract is nothing more than a bid matcher and once it it finds a matching bit bit to to what you want then it uh, it says okay found it boom and it sends the tokens both ways without any any uh, any intervening parties and uh, and they just show up in your wallet just like that boom or even uh, even in the in the chain account because there's that again there you have different levels but they're all they're all trusted accounts so it doesn't really matter the chain is never able to uh, rug pull anything that is in your account on the chain because there there is no way for the code to do that so level two accounts on chains are are pretty safe of course the, the safest mechanism is having your own tokens on the tangle yeah uh, in your own wallet but level two chain wallets i i'm the, the the way I see it is that people are going to if that that use people that use smart contracts a lot are going to be uh, depositing into their corresponding level two accounts so that they just have an amount of tokens to play with there so that uh, you don't have to go through the tangle for every single deposit that you need to do on the chain. That allows you to do offline uh, smart contract calls, smart contract requests, off-ledger requests, and those are blindingly fast. They, they are instantaneous, essentially, right? They don't need confirmation on the tangle, it's just, oh, you have the tokens. Okay, the tokens are there. So, boom, let's start processing your request. And that's going to be quite a game changer. I think you will you will see more uh, more tokens being held by change, where people. Uh, can can use them and the thing is if you put them in in a, in a, in a chain uh, you can just recall them you can withdraw your tokens at any time right yeah. you you have your account there that account is associated with your address you have the private key of that address nobody else has it nobody else can touch it you prove that you own your account and you get your entire deposit that's over there minus a few gas fees or such you get it all back so, and those are minuscule overhead amounts compared to what happens if you try to withdraw tokens from uh, an exchange where they take uh, percentages of your tokens just for holding them. So I think it will be, be much easier for people and they will, once they figure out how it works, it's, they will be much more inclined to have part of their tokens sitting in in a chain because it's just as safe there essentially yeah and then and then you can immediately transact with them if necessary that's the l1 fun i mean that's <laughs> And it also takes away a headache, uh, or well, headache, a slight headache, which is the dust, de the dust deposit. Uh, yes. Bullshit, right? If if you have your token sitting on the chain, you don't have to take dust deposits into account because the tokens are there. Yes, you've already filled the commitment. So. The... Yeah. The requirement, I should say. So, yeah. so I, I, I'm expecting people to just go like, okay, uh, I'll just send a bunch of iotas there, so that it's definitely enough to be able to run, right, uh, or be able to run for several requests, and only once it starts to get low, uh, I, I'm expecting that that will become a wallet functionality that will alert you to the fact that. Uh, you're running that low. You're, that you're running low on that chain. Maybe you want to replenish uh, 
I don't know. You you can you could set all kinds of alarms and triggers on that, right? So, oh yeah, uh, for sure. That's and then sure. and then you have your you have a large amount of tokens there that you only replenish every now and then with with a with a uh, sufficient amount to be able to do quite a bit of processing. If you if you do a lot of processing, it depends, of course, on uh, on your usage. And then you can just do whatever requests you want without having to transfer any tokens over the tangle. All you send is messages to the the web API of the uh, the chain, and uh, and they get processed. Yeah, and that's that, that's that. kind of different than the whole thing on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's going to be working, but that that those are things that that. That we can easily do on the Wasm side. Uh, I have no idea how the equivalent would work on the on the EVM side. <laughs> the funny thing is, um, you can send requests like that to the EVM, and you can send them off ledger. But what happens within the EVM that also is governed by some kind of system in addition to that so there you have your what do you call it impedance mismatch or <laughs> a, an extra layer in between essentially yeah maybe i'm mistaken i don't know uh, i don't know that much about evm I, i've looked into solidity contracts uh and I, I can read them enough to uh, convert them to to Wasm code, but uh, for the rest, I I haven't really looked into it. It's, it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's just uh, another uh, VM, and the next level is how it is it's being used with the with the DeFi system and such, uh, and that is uh, well. Less, less of interest to me, so I don't know as much about that. That's just essentially where I'm the tool builder and other developers use those tools to actually build software that users will use. Yeah. It'll be interesting. I mean, obviously, you're building a more, theoretically, a more performant and more capable system but you know it's all it's it's going to be the decision of the marketplace it's like can can that get past the the crowd noise and the and the largesse of uh what's already out there in the evm world even if it may not be as capable in some aspects so that'd be interesting um, well it, it might be that that evm is is the way into that system right yeah the trojan uh, horse but yeah. by sl slowly adding functionality that uh that requires iota and once that turns out to work really well and and cheap and fast and etc people will automatically gravitate to those systems that are using uh the tangle uh under underwater right uh, and then yeah we'll, we'll get i guess we'll have to see but you say once it's proven and Especially, of course, once there's a cost benefit, clearly, yeah, and then you can actually fund the migration, then it uh, should uh, should work out, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess if 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 at some point uh, it turns out that uh, certain functionality is very beneficial then the the next step will automatically be to make it native right uh, turn it into native functionality on on uh, on the iota chain and then only have an interface from evm to that native functionality so you're actually calling uh wasm smart contract for example from evm that masquerade as EVM contracts. But they uh, were built initially as EVM contracts 
and then when it, when they found out that that works better if you implement them as a WASM contract, then yeah, sure, why not? So that kind of Trojan horse. Yeah, that's uh -huh. yeah. I guess it's always a matter also what um, whatever the liquidity in DeFi and so we'll get that addressed because there's other hurdles uh, before yep. and cost aspects, but. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we have hit the uh, ten o'clock hour. Yeah. It, I'm sorry. Was there a comment? I missed it. Okay. Okay. We've uh, we hit the uh, ten o'clock hour. I think uh, we should call it a wrap. I appreciate uh, everyone um, for pitching in. Great questions. Of course, Eric, um, really great to hear all your thoughts on this and give us the insights as usual. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and end this. Thanks, Kumar, for recording this. And uh, we'll catch you guys um, in the next few days. Uh, just a little reminder, we got the big vote coming on uh, Bill versus Burn on Friday. And we'll be talking about that in the IATA Americas group on thir this Thursday evening, if anybody is so inclined. Okay, I will uh, wrap this up. You guys have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, Thank you. Bye-bye.